happy Sabbath to all. I'm happy to be here and uh, happy to share the Word of God uh, with you all. It is a miracle. These words are not heard very often. I remember about two years ago when a sister in Southern California was very ill and she was taken to the hospital and she was going down very rapidly. Her hands got dark. She had no circulation. She had no circulation in her feet. The doctor were ready to amputate um, her, uh, her fingers, her feet, her legs, and the infection went to her heart. And she got into a coma. The family was called. Family came from uh, Central America. Brothers and sisters, they all came. And they were all mourning the loss, the apparent loss of their beloved one. I remember going to the hospital to visit this sister. And she was there in the sixth or eighth floor of the hospital. But then in the main floor, there was a little corner, a little room, way smaller than this, a small chapel. We gathered in that chapel. We prayed. You know, some prayers, I remember, were saying, comfort the family for the loss of the sister. She wasn't dead. But I remember some prayers that says, Lord, save our dear sister. And uh, I also remember leaving the hospital on that Sabbath day and someone approached me and said, Brother, she's dying. She's going to die. And I said, No, she will live according to the Lord's will. Well, every day we heard news that our dear sister, that uh, the doctor would say she has, you know, 15% chance. And it came down to 5% chance. And then the doctor said, there is no hope. She's dying tonight. And again, the family was summoned. They were there all the time. And then suddenly came the news that the doctors opened her heart thinking that they were going to uh, find um, you know, a, a terrible situation. They found it was the, the, the heart was in very bad shape. They were able to operate. They replaced some valves in the heart. And uh, the sister lived. It was a miracle. And, and she is a miracle. Uh, today. Now she lives, she said, she lives not just because of her little daughters that God saved her life, but she lives to tell the story that God performs miracles. You know, there are miracles happening every day. Whenever a child is born, it is a miracle. Yes. When Christ was on this earth, he went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of diseases. Actually, how many sermons did Christ preach? Can you count them in your hands? Very few. The Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon to the 5,000 men and plus women and children. The Sermon to the 4,000 men, women and children. And he had a lot of dialogues on an individual basis, either on one-on-one, -on -one, as he had with Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman by the well, or he went to the homes, like the home of Zacchaeus and others, the home of Lazarus. And actually, most of Christ's work was actually tending to the needs of the people. He did more healing than he did preaching. In Christ's commission to the apostles in Luke chapter 9, verse 2, Christ commissioned the, the apostles in their very first missionary trip. And he commissioned them to preach the kingdom of God and to do what? To heal the sick. In the ministry of healing, 
page 19, we read that during his ministry, Jesus devoted more time to healing the sick than to preaching. And in Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 465, we read that the gospel which he taught was a message of spiritual life and physical restoration. So that was the gospel. Spiritual life, physical restoration. And you know what the spiritual life was? Deliverance from sin and the healing of disease were linked together. What is linked together? Deliverance from sin and the healing of disease were linked together. First, Christ meets the temporal necessities and he relieves the, the physical wants and suffering of humanity. And then, and this is what we should do. This is our work. And then we shall find an open avenue to the heart where we may plant the good seeds of virtue and religion. Testimonies, Volume 4, page 227. Now, from all the miracles that Christ performed, which was the greatest? Hmm. He healed the, the sick, all manner of diseases, Christ he healed. He healed the leper. He uh, gave sight to the blind, gave voice to the dumb, gave hearing to the, to the, uh, the, to, to the deaf. And he raised the dead. When he raised, when Christ raised the daughter of Jairus, Christ said that she was sleeping. And the Pharisees, they did not want the news to go around that Jesus was actually healing. So they spread the word, well, you know, she really wasn't dead. Maybe she was in a coma. And if she was dead, she was dead for maybe for a few hours. So he, that was no, not a miracle. But what about when Christ raised Lazarus? Hmm? Yes. Um, the raising of, of Lazarus was a mighty miracle. Lazarus was dead several days. His body was already decomposing. In uh, John chapter 11, verses 39 and 40, we read that Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, Lazarus' sister, um, the sister of the one who was dead, said unto him, O Lord, by this time he stinks, for he has been dead four days. Actually, they were three days plus. This was already the beginning of the fourth day. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. The raising of Lazarus was a most wonderful manifestation of the power of God. Verses 43 and 44 we read, And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Lose him and let him go. What a miracle. We read in Inspiration, Desire of Ages 529, that the crowning miracle, this crowning miracle, the raising of Lazarus, was to set the seal of God on his work and on his claim to divinity. Now, the Pharisees could no longer um, doubt the uh, Messiahship of Jesus Christ. What about the Sadduc Sadducees, who were not so much opposed to Christ in the beginning of Christ's ministry, but they didn't believe in the resurrection. So now, that was an open attack to their wrong beliefs, to their traditions. 
So they joined. The Pharisees and, and Sadducees now joined together in opposing the ministry of Jesus Christ. We also read further in Desire of Ages, page 537, that that miracle was the crowning evidence offered by God to men that he had sent his son into the world for their salvation. And, and what was the miracle? Was the miracle just raising Lazarus to life? That was more than that. You know, we think of this mighty miracle of, as a restoration uh, to physical life. In his ministry, Christ restored physical and spiritual lives. Which of the two is harder? What do you think? Is it the physical life or the spiritual life? Mm -hmm. So there is still a greater miracle than this great miracle of raising Lazarus. There is, there's another one. That is not the greatest of all miracles. It's a great miracle, but not the greatest of all miracles. Actually, the restoration of spiritual life or deliverance from sin is even a greater miracle. Let us look at some examples. Do you remember the story about the two mad men? Jesus had spent a night on the lake where he had performed a miracle. There was a terrible storm. The disciples thought that they were going to sink. They were, it was gone. It was all over until they found Jesus sleeping on the boat. And they called, Master, don't you care that we perish? And Jesus, with a very uh, firm but caring, melodious voice, said, Peace be still, and the sea became calm. After these words, then they crossed the, they completed their journey, they crossed the lake, and in the early morning, the Savior and his companions came to shore. The light of the rising sun touched the sea and land as with the benediction of peace. But no sooner they had stepped upon the beach, their eyes were greeted by a sight more terrible than the fury of the tempest. Wow, what could be worse than the sight of that terrible storm that they were about to, to die? From some hiding places from the tombs, two madmen rushed upon them as if to tear them in pieces. Oh, hanging from them, from their arms and from their feet were broken chains and also flesh and blood because they had cut themselves. Their flesh was torn and bleeding. Their eyes glared out from their long and matted hair their very likeness of humanity seemed to have been blotted out by the demons that possessed them, and they looked more like wild beasts than like men. Desire of Ages, page 337. And in Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, we read, And when he was come to the other side in the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. Everybody avoided that. They were just terrified. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither? to torment us before the time. And you know the story. Jesus expelled the demons from these men. They fell at Jesus' feet and worshipped him. They were free. Not only that, but these two men, they, were, they looked more like wild beasts than human beings, became mighty workers for Jesus 
they became missionaries. They had not even gone through their seminary preparation. They had not even been baptized. Do you know you don't have to be baptized to be a missionary? You can tell others what Jesus has done for you. And that's exactly what they went to do. They were greater disciples or greater missionaries than the disciples themselves. They went about their city telling, pe telling people what God had done for them. You know, Christ wanted to teach the disciples a lesson. The encounter with the demoniacs had a lesson for the disciples. It showed the depths of degradation with which Satan is seeking to drag the whole real human race and the mission of Christ to set men free from Satan's power. You know, actually, what happened to, to those two men, to those two demoniacs, is a representation of what will happen to most of the world when Jesus withdraws his presence from the most holy place. And when that is when probation closes. So it's going to be repeated, brethren. Satan's influence is constantly exerted upon men to distract the senses, to control the mind for evil and incite to violence and crime. He weakens the body, darkens the intellect, and debases the soul. And where is our safeguard against Satan's power? It is only found in the presence of Jesus Christ. The Zara of Ages 3, 41. And souls that have been degraded uh, and uh, are, that are still under the influence of the enemy may through the power of Christ be transformed into messengers of righteousness and can be sent forth by the Son of God to tell what great things the Lord has done for them. What about the three converts at the cross? Do you remember reading about three men who, well, they were not Christians. They were not followers of Jesus. There was the Roman soldier, a centurion. Do you know what the preparation is for a Roman soldier? They are trained to hate. They are trained to kill. They are trained uh, to kill even if they are commanded to kill women and children, innocent ones. They were machines. They were war machines. And yet, that Roman centurion saw in the face of Jesus that was on the cross, compassion and love. And he exclaimed, truly, this was the Son of God. And then there was... Uh, Simon the Cyrian, who carried the cross of Jesus, he realized that this innocent man, being put through so much suffering, and he's not even cursing those that are persecuting him. That man was touched, and he was also converted. And then the thief, one of the two thieves, he accepted Jesus Christ. Those were mighty miracles even right to the cross. There were conversions. There were mighty miracles. Can such people be changed? Can such ones be saved? Only by the transforming power of God. The, the conversion of these three men's Three men was a mighty miracle. 
The restoration of mind and soul to the image of God is a mighty miracle. The conversion of the human heart. Now, I'm sure that you might have heard this question being asked. Why are not more miracles being performed today? By those, especially by those who claim to be God's people. Brethren, quote, Brethren, the greatest miracle that can be wrought is the conversion of the human heart. We need to be reconverted, losing sight of self and human ideas, and beholding Christ, that we may be transformed into his likeness. When this, the greatest of all miracles, is wrought within our hearts, we shall see the workings of other miracles. Actually, besides the Roman soldier, besides Simon the Cyrene and the thief on the cross, there's still a greater miracle, brethren, brothers and sisters. You know what's the greatest miracle? Yes, sister, sister June, thank you. It's when I get converted. The greatest miracle is my conversion or my reconversion. That is the greatest miracle. Can God work miracles through us while we are not converted or when we are unconverted? God cannot, quote, God cannot work through us miraculously while we are unconverted. Uh, by the way, these are references from uh, Manuscript Releases, Book 4, page 113. You know why? If God would work a miracle through us, if we are unconverted? Well, we would just be c continue uncon being unconverted. We'd become spoiled. It says it would spoil us. For we would take it as an evidence that what? That God accepts us the way we are. That we were perfect in His sight. By living faith, claiming His promise of forgiveness. Those who see Christ by living faith. Those who abide in Him. Pay attention to these words. Those who abide in Him will have power to work miracles for His glory. Why is it that miracles are not? being performed. I should say, why is it that more miracles are not being performed today? Because we're unconverted. That's what we read. You know, when we are converted, we will reveal the character of God. Christ came to this earth to reveal the character of the Father. Through Christ, we may reveal the character of the Father. Quote, The highest evidence that Christ came from God is that His life revealed the character of God. He did the works and spoke the words of God. Such a life is the greatest of all miracles. The same is, uh, Zarb Ages 406, the same is true. Then, when we shall reveal the character of God, through Jesus Christ, of course, by doing what? By abiding in Him. By surrendering our lives to Him and by abiding in Christ. We shall have power to work miracles for His glory. Then, what? We shall do His works and speak the words of God. And this shall be the greatest miracle. Before Jesus called Lazarus, come forth, He said, Roll away the stone. Brethren, what is the stone 
that is blocking you, that is holding you back. You know, that was a mighty big stone. It was not a stone that had to be rolled by one man alone. It took mighty power to roll that stone. In fact, in order to roll away the stone of our, li our lives, it has to be a mighty power. It's a super natural power, not a human power. It's the power of Jesus Christ. The power of the cross can roll away the stone that is blocking us from surrendering fully to God. Quote, in perfect obedience to God's will, we are to manifest adoration, love, cheerfulness, and praise, and thus honor and glorify God. It is in this way alone that man may reveal the character of God in Christ to the world. How are we to reveal the character of, of God? Through adoration, love, cheerfulness, and praise. That's how we're going to honor and glorify God. And Amazing Grace, page 58. So today, Christ is saying, Take away the stone that is holding back James or Peter or Mary or Lisa. Take away the stone. Jesus is ready to order the stone to be taken away so long as we yield our lives to him. And are you willing to give up the stone that is a burden in your life? Let the stole, stone Roll away. Now Jesus calls you. He says, come forth, my child. Come, sinners, to the foot of the cross. C come, ye blessed of my Father. Matthew 25, 34. Come, ye blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the, of the world. Jesus is calling you today to come forth. Come forth out of the tomb of this world. Come forth and inherit the kingdom. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before your throne of grace this Sabbath morning with thankful hearts. We praise your name because Jesus is our Savior and our friend. We thank you for this wonderful gift of Jesus who died on the cross of Calvary to save us. Help us now to yield our lives to him fully and uh, to live by faith the life of Christ. We pray, Father, that we may be kind and cheerful and may represent Christ in all that we do and say. We ask you, Father, to roll away the stones that might be impediments to our salvation, the burdens that we might be carrying, the burden of sin, the burden of guilt, burden of doubt, fear, whatever it may be. We, pr we pray that we may all lay all our burdens at the foot of the cross and that we may hear the call, come forth. We may come forth and stand before Jesus that we may surrender our lives fully to him. Bless each one here today, those who could not be present, be with your people around the world. Help us to recommit our lives to you and to serve you we pray for children, youth, and those who are suffering persecution, those who are ill. Help us to hang on to Jesus, to his mighty arm, by faith. Dismiss us now with your love and care and help us, Lord, to um, continue witnessing for you and bless the, uh, the upcoming seminar that souls may be one for your kingdom. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.